country's development. From providing energy and supporting irrigation to regulating water supplies. But in local communities, dams have caused controversy. When a dam is built on their land, not only are natural ecosystems disrupted, but thousands of people are forced to resettle. The past has shown that too often these displaced Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm uh, now going to uh, introduce uh, Professor Nancy Rothwell, the President and Vice Chancellor of the University, who will be uh, welcoming you tonight. But just before we do that, uh, I have to let you know that there are no plans for fire alarms tonight. So should one go off, we would have to leave. But I'm sure it won't. Okay. So thank you very much indeed, David, and a very warm welcome to you all to the University of Manchester, particularly those of you who've traveled uh, significant dif distances and who will be partnering on this very exciting DAMS 2.0 research and capacity building program, uh, which really resonates with the university and its goals. So tonight is the launch of that, and you'll be hearing a public lecture from Cambridge's Professor Bill Adams. So DAMS 2.0 is a four-year initiative that will grapple with the question of how to build better DAMS. And the thing that I particularly like about this project is that it's not just about the technical aspects of the DAMS. It's the social, the environmental, the political perspective as well. 
all too often, some countries build structures for other countries, imposing on them what they feel will be right. And I think it's absolutely appropriate that many of the partner countries are the ones where dams are being built and that these factors are being considered. The project's been awarded £8 million from the UK Global Challenges Research Fund, um, which is administered by our Research Councils UK, and it's part of the British Aid budget. But it's a fantastic example of how that Grand Challenges Research Budget can actually be used for the benefits for which those funds were directed, for enhancing international activities, and indeed for strengthening international partnerships. And the objective, of course, is to make a tangible difference to the lives of people in developing countries and to raise the capacity of researchers across the world to design and build their own dams that meet their own country's needs for electricity, for water, for irrigation and for recreation. So in a moment, um, Professor David Hume, Executive Director of our Global Development Institute, will, who's leading the project, he'll give you a few more details. But I think the key part of this project is the way it brings together researchers and students from different disciplines, from civil engineering, political science, eco economics, and the Global Development Institute. And for me, it's particularly important for the University of Manchester. So we decided a few years ago that we would identify five research beacons, areas in which we had great strength and depth. And two of those five are energy and global inequalities. So to have two of five beacons from very diverse parts of the university, completely different faculties, coming together to both develop and now to hopefully deliver on a project like this for benefit to civil engineering, structural engineering, environment, and our goals in making a difference across the world is extremely important. It's also important to us as a university very much embedded in Manchester, but also which considers itself an international university with more international students than any other in uh, the UK. And as I was just mentioning to a colleague, it's particularly relevant that we have a scheme called the Equity and Merit Scholarships, which are scholarships for funding for master's students from the poorest countries in the world. And some of those countries are featuring in your DAMS 2.0. So I'm hoping we can join up those very, very talented students who want to come and study here, then go back home again with this project, because it sounds to me like a great opportunity. So for us, um, this is fantastic to have the award, of course, it's a very major one, but it's also particularly important because this project, above all else, addresses some of the big challenges uh, across the world. And we've now just brought this into our undergraduate training. So our first year students are all offered training in environmental sustainability, and just a couple of weeks ago, 5,000 of them across the campus took part in that training in environmental sustainability. So this project typifies what I think universities should be doing, addressing global problems and global challenges across disciplines and across the world. And I do wish you the very best in this exciting project. I shall be keeping an eye on it. Let me now hand over to David to tell you a bit more about it. Thank you. So is he looking for his uh, PowerPoint? Is it? Oh. Okay, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll talk about, uh, about it um, j just for a few minutes. Nancy's given us a fabulous uh, introduction there, and I think you also saw those excellent videos that we started off with, which summarized a lot about, uh, about what we know about dams and what we know about how, be to, how to make them better um, in the future. Um, <laughs> We are uh, wanting to introduce it to people uh, at the university and beyond the university tonight because uh, we hope you'll interact with us. We hope you'll be looking at our web pages, reading some of the research we do. If you've got interest in this field, then let us know so that we can work out whether in our seminars, in the programs we're doing, the research we're doing, whether we can uh, work with you um, on that. We've called the project DAMS 2.0, and I'll explain why we've gone for that. We've also got this uh, very long name uh, talking about Nexus um, Systems. Um, there's a whole set of partners from around the world involved, but we're working particularly closely with the International Institute for Environment uh, and Development at Manchester. It's the School of Engineering and the Global Development Institute that are particularly uh, involved in it. The basic sort of background to this is at the moment there's a global boom in uh, hydropower and dam uh, construction. And on this illustration that you've got here, then we've got... Uh, 
all of the blue spots are dams that are under construction and the red spots are ones that are at a serious stage of planning now. Something like 3,700 dams are uh, being planned, most of them um, in, uh, in developing countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. Um, new dams have got incredible potential, if they're well designed and well operated, to contribute to improving human lives, uh, to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Dams obviously can generate electricity, which can create jobs for people, can allow them to live more comfortable and healthier lives. Uh, dams can feed irrigation systems so that agricultural productivity can be raised and food security uh, can be improved, and they can contribute to, uh, to a whole set of benefits. However, if they're badly designed or badly operated, then they can cause social and environmental problems. Um, and that's what we are very keen to make sure that we can avoid uh, by leading to uh, uh, dams being better designed. There's three very basic questions that we're asking. We're asking what's happening now, and in the early months of our research, we're going to get the state of the art and chart what's happening around the world. We'll then be asking the question much more difficult, what should be improved, what could be improved? And using both scientific and social scientific analytical methods to try and answer that question. And then we'll be saying, how can we take the knowledge that we create, the knowledge that we co-produce with our partners in Africa and Asia and other parts of the world, how can we take that uh, forward? Dams do, as those uh, films that you saw, have a very checkered history. And our basic account would be Dams 1.0, which were the dams that were built um, in the era of decolonization and independence, particularly in Asia and Africa, um, got dams a very bad reputation. Many of these dams were financed by aid agencies, were extremely profitable for European and North American engineering companies, but they had cost overruns, and they failed to deliver in terms of the electricity generation they promised, the areas that were to be irrigated, uh, and the impacts, uh, the, the, the beneficial impacts they promised. Often they produced uh, very uh, adverse social side effects, particularly on people who were displaced. Around the end of the 1980s, then we moved into a moratorium on dams, and for almost 20 years, uh, dam construction in the developing world was... Uh, was highly constrained and very limited. But in the last few years, we've moved into this new era, which we're calling Dams 2.0. And now dams are being built around the world at a, an unprecedented um, pace, partly because of the uh, emerging powers, China and India and Brazil have engaged with dam construction in their own countries and in other countries, and partly because new sources of finance are becoming available uh, so that countries have a set of choices about where they might finance their dams from. And as we've said, we're very, much, very keen on ensuring that the mistakes of the past are not repeated and that we manage to build uh, better dams. Our aims and objectives, uh, I won't read them there, but they're set out there, and it is essentially that we'll be able to contribute to more rapid development and achievement of the SDGs through dam design and operation. But that means understanding Nexus systems, and we had a, a team of about 40 people uh, in Manchester today designing uh, some of the research that we're going to be doing, and we're certainly finding that that is, uh, is stretching our brains trying to work out how we look at systems which are about managing water, managing electricity, managing food supply, impacting on health, and a whole set of, uh, of systems effects. It will involve long-term cross-disciplinary work, and so we're trying to weld together teams which aren't just uh, in a way, in, in, in working in their discipline, but can talk to people outside of their discipline. Um, and we'll also be looking at building institutional capacity internationally, but not simply creating knowledge, but developing partnerships across the world that can help us to educate the next generation um, of dam engineers, the people who take decisions about dams. Um, as I've said, so research is our initial focus, but then we'll be looking at high interest applications, whether we can lead to improved decisions, particularly in our case study uh, regions in West Africa, um, in East Africa, in the Nile Basin, and in Myanmar and South Asia. And then we'll also be looking at building capacity and thinking about the legacy uh, that we could leave through a series of, of partnerships through producing um, open access web-based tools, which will be competing with expensive proprietorial tools that engineering companies produce, uh, and by looking at in-country production of knowledge with our partners. Um, example, uh, certainly, that we, we'll be working on is the, the Volta Basin. Our colleague, 
Emmanuel uh, Osubobi has been uh, looking at this, but uh, Ghana has one very big dam, the, uh, the, the Asakongo Dam, which uh, has been operating much, uh, much below the capacity that was promised. It's built a new dam. It's looking at building a whole series of new dams, and we'll be looking at whether we can help decision-making um, along the River Volta so that we don't just get individual good dams, but we manage the water so that it can be productive for the people of Ghana. That's the grand objective that we've set ourselves in four years' time will be judged as to whether we've achieved it. Thank you. Can I pass back to Nancy? So thank you, David, for that very brief overview. Obviously, you'll be hearing a lot more about DAMS 2.0, and I should at this point apologize that I won't be able to learn about it on this occasion because I'm dashing off to the launch of the Manchester Science Festival but you will have the pleasure of enjoying our speaker this evening. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker who is Professor Bill Adams, Moran Professor of Conservation and Development at the University of Cambridge, where he's taught in the Department of Geography since 1984. So he has been a great collaborator and friend of the university uh, for many years, though I've noted that we, uh, we've as yet failed to attract him to actually come and work with us. That, that's something we'll continue to work on. Um, Bill's uh, work approaches questions of environmental development and conservation from perspectives of political ecology and environmental history. He's worked for many years on river basin planning in Africa, he was the lead writer on social impacts for the World Commission on dams and is an internationally recognized scholar on the linkages between conservation and development in Africa and in the UK. So his expertise seems perfectly suited for this launch lecture for Dams 2.0. Many of you will, of course, know him from his numerous books and articles, which are far too many for me to mention. Professor Adams will be talking this evening about designing dams that don't cost the earth, which I assume means in terms of both environmental and financial impact. So please welcome our speaker this evening, Bill. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you for having me. Um, when David asked me to, uh, to give this lecture, I uh, agreed um, rather, rather rapidly, which is always unwise, um, and I reflected that it's um, quite a problematic lecture to give for two reasons. Firstly, we have a very large, very exciting uh, project, but we haven't started it yet. Well, actually, strictly we have started it, but we haven't uh, got going on it, so I can't tell you what it's going to do. Um, and secondly, the room is at least half full of people who know as much or more than I do about dams, and therefore I'm in the business of teaching uh, grandma how to suck eggs. Um, that aside, I thought the best thing I could do would be to um, say, start off by saying something um, uh, of a personal nature, a personal history of my uh, introduction to, uh, to dams. Not uh, because I think this history, uh, this particular project is particularly important or interesting. It's quite small. It's in the northwest of Nigeria, but because I think it'll give you, it gives a, uh, an opportunity to root the debates that we've just been hearing David talk about and which the videos were talking about earlier uh, into a particular sort of place. So let me uh, take you to the, the dam that I first experienced, the world of dam builders and dam designers that I experienced and the people who were affected. The project is in the northwest of Nigeria on the Sokotu River. Um, and the river has a very strongly seasonal flow. It's in the, the, the dry part of Nigeria, effectively the part of the Sahel. Uh, it rains between in July, uh, August, um, part of September. Massive discharges at that time of year. And then it's dry for the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the year round. So once it's stopped raining, so from now onwards, it won't rain again until probably the middle of June. So it's an ideal place, uh, if you're a dam builder, to think what we need to do is hold back the water in the wet season, and then we can use it in the dry season. That's precisely um, what the, uh, the designers did. You can see the location of the project there. Uh, the river runs down to the city of Sokotu, uh, and then the, the Sokotu or the Rima River runs down uh, into the Niger. So it's part of the Niger Basin, ultimately. And this is the river at full flood uh, above the, the, the dam location uh, in the middle of uh, probably late August uh, after a few days of heavy rain. 
So, um, when, by the time I got there in 1979, they had already um, started the process of, of resettling people from the dam area, four or 5,000 people from villages uh, in the floodplain who were going to be flooded by the dam. And they did that by um, uh, moving them um, up the hill beside the dam site. And in fact, because they realized that, there was, that the hill was not a particularly fertile place and there was no water, they put in a small pump irrigation scheme to lift water up to the new resettlement villages. It was pretty unpopular with those people. Um, they, uh, the project was quite slow to get off the ground, and there were quite a few arguments uh, about the, uh, the payment of uh, compensation and so on around that. I wasn't involved in that, but I watched it happening, and it was quite uh, instructive as to how difficult it was to do something uh, so apparently simple. I mean, if you're an engineer, it seemed to the engineers I met and talked to, it seemed relatively simple. Sure, sure, there's some people to resettle. We know how to do that. We build roads, we build houses, we build a little irrigation scheme. We can sort it out. It proved quite, uh, quite tricky. And one ended up in quite a the, the map on the right is a, um, an author photo, so their photograph, so which has been geometrically corrected. So you can actually look at farmers' fields and you can survey the fields that they've got and then you've got a basis for a compensation scheme. Quite a complicated process. The bottom left is one of the cars that got burnt in one of the riots uh, when the people protested against the process. More interesting to me and what I did my own research on was what happened downstream of the dam. Uh, the dam is at the, at the, uh, the top there, just on the right-hand side of that old-fashioned blue map. Um, and downstream, the river runs through a broad floodplain with a large number of uh, settlement villages in it. Take it off? Okay. Uh, right. Looks like I'm having a different microphone. Um, so uh, in that floodplain, this is a view looking down into the floodplain in the dry season, um, where, uh, and this is the same, uh, pretty much the same view in the wet season. Um, the whole of that floodplain is cultivated quite intensively. Uh, and um, when the dam was, uh, was constructed, um, the uh, flow pattern from the river was quite dramatically shifted. And what that meant was that all of the economic activities that were going on in the floodplain were, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, disrupted. So uh, this is a, a field on the edge of the river. Uh, it's a mixture of rice, uh, West African rice and sorghum uh, growing together. The two have quite distinct... Um, uh, flood requirements in terms of timing and depth of duration, and farmers had quite a sophisticated knowledge um, of uh, which kinds of crops, which kinds of crop varieties um, were best suited to different flooding locations. When the dam went in, of course, the flood patterns were completely shifted. The peak floods uh, were stopped, and you had a much more constant flow. Many of the fields didn't flood at all, and the natural irrigation that the floodplain had allowed wasn't, was no longer possible. And that wasn't just at the dam site. That was for 120 kilometers downstream until the next river came in. And it changed the dynamics between cultivators and pastoralists, uh, the, the people who came in in the dry season to graze the, the, uh, the old fields, uh, and the fishermen. So all those economic systems were disrupted. And when you, uh, in ways that were not predicted by the people who designed and built the dam, uh, uh, Italian company as it happens, um, they weren't taken into account, they weren't understood, um, and um, they were uh, a considerable problem. So in terms of, there were a set of impacts of this project which were uh, quite um, unrecognized. Uh, uh, the floodplain downstream, which you can see in this um, satellite, uh, uh, image there um, was outside the project area. The impacts were not assessed. Uh, there was no mandate for any of the companies uh, working at the dam site, building the dam and the associated irrigation scheme. There was no assessment of the impacts of the. Pro uh, uh, there was uh, no mandate to address those project, those problems. Not only did they not see them, but it wasn't. They weren't asked. They had no terms of reference to address them, and the impacts were complicated and changed over time. Luckily, I would say, luckily, a few years after this, um, a new technology of irrigation arrived uh, using small pumps from very shallow groundwater. And that revolutionized production in the floodplain. And if you like, it saved the, uh, the livelihoods of floodplain farmers. Here are the, some of the people I worked with uh, and interviewed in my, my project. Um, I, and they're doing a very simple form of irrigation on this onion field, simply with a calabash on a long pole. Dig a well, lift up the water. Now, you give these people uh, a small uh, pump, and they can expand production in the dry season. That was lucky. Um, and it became, the whole floodplain became quite a, an effective irrigation scheme uh, that wasn't initially uh, uh, appreciated. 
Meanwhile, the purposes for which the dam was built uh, were primarily irrigation, and there was a large-scale irrigation scheme created, and that wasn't very successful either. It's still there. It's a tiny fraction of the, its design size. Um, but uh, when you looked at the cost-benefit analysis and compared it to what happened, uh, the construction costs were underestimated. It was more expensive than they expected. The, um, the yields which they uh, were replacing, the rain-fed yields, were systematically underestimated, um, and the predicted yields from irrigation were overestimated. So the economic returns were a fraction of what they'd expected. They also had hoped that they would, uh, they would benefit from a series of commercial investments that didn't happen. So they hoped that they would, um, they would uh, have a uh, commercial tomato canning factory. But there was no part of the planning to actually build it, so it wasn't built. And you can't grow tomatoes and sell them at that price uh, as a cash crop if there's no one to buy them. And so the, the, the basis on which the economics were calculated were, uh, were, uh, were un uh, uns were faulty. Um, and they had thought that large parts of the irrigation area were empty and therefore could be taken over by agribusiness and run as a large-scale farm. But in fact, when they actually started uh, doing the survey, people popped out of the bushes and said, actually, that's my land. And it was their land. They just weren't using it uh, at that particular time. So every part of it was claimed uh, and therefore, there was no spare area, there was no agribusiness, uh, there was no tomato factory, there were very poor uh, economic returns. They also misunderstood the importance of off-farm labor. So they thought that in the dry season, everybody was idle. Uh, um, but in fact, that's not true. Uh, in northern Nigeria, there's a great tradition of seasonal labor migration. So people would go off to the cities and earn money. Uh, and they didn't want, really, to stay back uh, to take on irrigation. So that was not at all a successful thing. So with that experience uh, in my uh, start of what I could call my career, at the time I thought I was starting a career in, um, you know, in land use planning. It turned out not that way. I ended up a career in a university. But I tried to understand why it was that a dam like this could be built like this, uh, how it is that you could uh, build that construction projects of this kind were as unproductive as they were. And therefore, the interesting question is, how do you not do that? How do you build a project which is flexible and intelligent and very holistic in its understanding of the challenges and which designs uh, strategies to meet it? That's the, the challenge that, uh, that has interested me for the last few decades. Let me say something about dam building. The first thing I want to say is that it, it is really the subject of dreams. And I put Woody Guthrie here. I don't know if any of you know his, uh, his uh, album, Roll on Columbia, but an uh, extraordinary piece of writing, Woody Guthrie, famous American uh, country uh, folk singer. Um, and this is a song that he wrote uh, for, the, um, for the Bureau of Reclamation uh, about developments in the Columbia, written in 1944. Um, and, and he talks, this is just part of it, he talks about the world has seven wonders that the travelers always tell, but the greatest wonder is the big Columbia River and the big Grand Coulee Dam. And he goes on talking about the way in which the Grand Coulee Dam was a response to the depression uh, in, in America in the 1930s. Big river, but river, while you're rambling, you can do some work for me. Let's harness this river. Let's harness this river for the greatness of the nation. And he talks about the, the, the factories that are humming in Washington and Oregon, making chrome and manganese and aluminium for the planes that were fighting the Second World War. Um, uh, and it, the, the driver for that was the great Grand Coulee Dam. Now, uh, Woody Guthrie was famous for being a, a labor activist, so here he is perhaps um, uh, not, in his natural, uh, not making his natural argument, but I think it perfectly captures the, the vision and the passion that dam building has, and it's important not to forget that because there's such a sort of a grinding negativity about the literature about dams, but it captures this sense of vision and development. And uh, this is the dam, the Grand Coulee Dam uh, on the Columbia River. 
Um, the decision to build it was taken in uh, 1935, and the decision to build it high, there was a second proposal to make it lower. There was a debate about what kind of dam do we want. Uh, they made it high, they completed it in 1942 for hydroelectricity and irrigation. This is a picture while it was being built in the late 1930s, that's it, finished. You can get some sense uh, of the size and, and the dramatic nature of it. And it's there as a sort of a monument in the, in the emptied American West, an American West that was, that was emptied of its indigenous population and then resettled. And it's one of the ways in which the American West was made. It was an engine of economic development, and that vision is really uh, very important. And in order to do that, in order to build dams, in order to, uh, to put this piece of a development puzzle in place, um, it, through the 20th century, increasingly we became sophisticated in ways of uh, planning river basins. So you had to decide where the dam went. And you can look back into the history of dam making for a long, long time, but one of the earliest actually is, is the Nile. We've been talking about the Nile uh, as part of this new project. But from 1904, there were uh, hydrological planning uh, being, there was hydrological planning being done on the Nile um, from an Egyptian perspective looking upstream uh, towards, um, towards tropical Africa um, and trying to understand the dynamics of flow in the Nile. Quite complicated, the two uh, big tributaries, the uh, White Nile coming out of what's now Uganda, the uh, Blue Nile coming out of, of Ethiopia and the big Sud swamps in the middle. So uh, more than a century now of doing the hydrology on a river basin scale and on the basis of that hydrology starting to make uh, political uh, and technical decisions about the development uh, in that basin. But the development that everybody talks about when it comes to river basin planning is not uh, the Nile, um, it's the Tennessee Valley and the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, which was um, a, a development of the depressed 1930s, like the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, and it was a federal corporation created by Congressional Charter in 1933. And I've written up here what it was actually for, because it's, it isn't only about the development of water resources. It was to improve navigability, provide flood control, provide for reforestation and the proper use of marginal lands, provide for agriculture and industrial development of the valley to provide for the national defense by the creation of a corporation for the operation of government properties at or near Muscle Shoals, which was a big uh, dam and power station. It was a holistic vision of state uh, investment in uh, the, the local economy. And they did everything. They did land management, they did river engineering, they did power generation. So we think of them, it's written up in the dam's literature, as a river basin planning, meaning a dam planning inst uh, institution. But it was actually a great deal more than that. And even at the time, there were, there were uh, complaints uh, about some of the dam constructions. If you ever, ever, ever want to see uh, in dramatic form uh, the uh, a, a film about um, the problems of resettlement, watch the uh, 1960s uh, Wild River. Um, a, a very passionate sort of black and white uh, movie. But what was interesting about the TVA is it was rolled out after the Second World War as a model for international development in, in uh, what became thought of as the developing world. First, I think, in the Mekong, the Mekong Committee, um, picking up as part of the, uh, as a sort of, as a framework for planning uh, in, uh, after the independence of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, surviving through the various wars of Indochina and then coming back on stream in the 1970s and into the present day as a way of framing development. And the original UN report, the development of the water resources of the Lower Mekong, proposed uh, five dams, uh, 90,000 square kilometers of irrigation, 13 uh, gigawatts of power generation, a massive investment uh, in, in water resource development. But the same thing was rolled out across Africa in the 1960s, the Volta River Authority, the Niger Delta Development Board, uh, the Niger River Commission, and then in the 1970s, the OMVS in, on the Senegal River and others in Kenya, and then slightly later uh, in Nigeria, the ones that I had built the dam or had overseen the building of the dam that I worked on. So this model that if you want to develop water resources, you have to do a river basin plan um, is something that we have come to see uh, through the 20th century. 
And part of that, the centerpiece of all those plans was dams. They were locating dams in river basins. So the big famous ones in Africa in the, in the 60s, uh, Akasombo and Volta and others, Zambezi, for example, with Kariba and Kahorabasa and others. And by the end of the mid-1980s, um, there were about 40,000 dams over 50 meters high globally. So it had been a very successful sort of strategy. Um, and this is a, a picture from the International Commission um, uh, on large dams, data from them on, on dam construction in different places. And you can see how uh, in Asia in particular, uh, very rapid development in the post-war period in dam construction, slightly slower in Africa. Africa is not such an easy place to build dams. And the benefits are well, were, are well rehearsed. Um, I don't need to go into them, but the dams can generate power, they can provide water, they can generate supply irrigation schemes, they can deliver flood control, uh, they can deliver improved navigation by raising water levels, they're useful in pollution control in things like debris dams and tailings, um, and they're useful in recreation, all those sort of functions are there. There are also negative impacts. Uh, there's problems of reservoir resettlement around uh, the, the trauma of moving people and their long-term health if they're living on reservoir margins with things like malaria and bilharzia and so on. There's all sorts of problems re-establishing resettlement livelihoods. Equally, you can get dams like the Volta Dam where there's a very healthy fishery and new economy of fishing. It shifts economic opportunities around. There are problems of sedimentation. Some reservoirs uh, fill up with sediment rather fast, particularly smaller ones in higher, uh, steeper landscapes, and that depends on how you manage the catchment. And there's all sorts of questions about the development of the lake ecology. And there are real challenges downstream, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the hydrology, is uh, the flow pattern of the river downstream is completely transformed. The extent of flooding, the timing of flooding, the duration, the slope of what they call the flood recession curve as the flood dies away. And those things have a triggering effect on uh, the, the river channel, the shape of the channel is a tendency for channels without sediment to start eroding, for example. It has effects on um, the, the ecology of the fresh water, it affects the aquatic ecosystem and particularly the fish that live in it, and it also affects the floodplain ecosystem, the wetlands of the floodplain. And that affects the, the economic and social lives of people who are dependent on the river, the fishermen, the floodplain farmers, and so on. Um, so it's quite a substantial transformation that is brought about by that process. And because of that, the rash of dam building, from the, particularly from the 70s onwards, became a, uh, the target of attack by uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, and uh, these are just some of them, environmentalists in somewhere like North America, for example, protesting top left on sort of freeing the Snake River, but others across the rest of the world. Some of them concerned about amenity, about beauty, about biodiversity. Some of them concerned about the livelihoods of the people who were being moved uh, and, and were being, um, uh, were being um, resettled and, and inadequately compensated, particularly where dams, for example, were being built in areas inhabited by indigenous groups who were getting what they felt a raw deal. Protests, I might say, were not new. Um, I've been doing a bit of reading about the history of protests about dams, and they go back about as far as the records go with regard to dam building. So there's a lot, of, lot about the, the complaints about mill dams. For example, in the USA, uh, the 18th century, the Bilarica Dam uh, in, on the east side, on the Concord River uh, in the USA. And here's Henry Thoreau, that great environmentalist, talking about the shad, which is a migratory fish that used to be in these eastern rivers in very large numbers, would go, go up the river to breed and then go back to the sea. Mere shad, he says, armed only with innocence and a just cause, I for one am with thee, and who knows what may avail a crowbar against the Bilarica Dam. That's not a very big dam, um, but nonetheless the principle is there. These kind of impacts have been felt for a long time. And there's a famous set of cases in the 19th century about other dams, for example the Kennebec Dam in Maine where uh, local people complaining about uh, the loss of fishing and the flooding of their lands. The other things that America's point to, the classic debate is about the uh, Hetch Hetchy Dam in the, in the Yosemite, uh, sorry, the Shaughnessy Dam in the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. 
the rather gaunt fellow top right uh, is John Muir, um, who started the Sierra Club, thought of as another great visionary of environmentalism. Bottom right, there he is with President Roosevelt in Yosemite, uh, sharing his wilderness values um, and uh, arguing that the, uh, the dam shouldn't be built. 1913 it was uh, to supply uh, San Francisco. Interestingly, bottom left is a, um, an imaginary image because they're now thinking of taking, well, there's now an argument, they should take the dam out again because it no longer has any purpose. Um, uh, and so we could come round full circle. But environmentalists in particular got their teeth into dam uh, complaints. The big issue was probably the, um, the Echo Park Dam uh, in the um, 1950s. I might say it had been there on the stocks for at least uh, 10 years prior to that. And in the 1950s, it was proposed as part of a big Colorado River project. Um, and it was going to flood part of the, uh, the Green River Valley and part of the Dinosaur National Monument. And there was a very big, very public campaign by the Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society against it. And they won their case, partly because the US Bureau of Reclamation's uh, calculations were wrong. They had, mis they had, they had made poor predictions. Um, but they agreed, as part of it, not to oppose the Gen Canyon Dam, which is the one that's photographed here. And so environmentalists remember this as a victory that led to a failure. Um, the dam uh, industry sees it as a, a failure which uh, is all too easily repeated. And so through the end of the 20th century, the era of, um, of environmentalism, you had an increasing frequency of opposition to dams, environmentalist opposition to dams. Uh, Edward Abbey's great novel of environmental activism, The Monkey Wrench Gang, if any of you read it, um, has as its, its sort of final part uh, takes place on the, uh, the Glen Canyon uh, the Grand Canyon Dam, and uh, the idea of monkey wrenching, the idea of sort of radically re, uh, releasing nature uh, is still there in, um, in a lot of thinking. This is the, the cover of a, uh, um, a, a recent video about uh, the removal of dams, uh, and actually U.S. dam removal has become quite an industry. They've become quite skilled at getting rid of dams that have reached the end of their design life and no longer have a design function. And there is a protest movement against the removal of dams. You can find similar things of people with placards in, in town streets saying, save our dam, uh, don't take it away. Um, uh, just, you know, it says, you know, people not fish, uh, for example. Uh, but that same movement, the idea of, uh, uh, that, that dam construction was out of hand, its impacts were unreasonably uh, uh, unreasonable, um, spread internationally. And so by the 1990s, we were in the position where international donors were coming under um, a, an increasing amount of pressure not to fund new dam projects, or at least to fund new, to be very careful about social and environmental impacts on dam projects. In 1994, the so-called Manavelli Declaration called for a, a moratorium on all World Bank funding and large dams. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is partly to say there's nothing new about this argument. There's nothing new uh, about the challenge that this new project is trying to address, which is how do you build a dam which is on balance a good dam, the right dam in the right place? How do you manipulate water resources without causing uh, more problems uh, than you, uh, than you uh, fix? And how do you do it without creating uh, more losers uh, than winners? So, End of the 20th century, people felt they had, they, the, the time had come to kind of put all this knowledge and experience together. And in 1997, there was a meeting uh, between the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, IUCN, uh, and the World Bank in Switzerland, a workshop, quite a small workshop, which uh, recommended that there should be call, formed a, a world commission on dams to try and pull together knowledge and experience about what worked in dam construction and what didn't. Let's put all the people who think there ought to be more dams and all the people who hate dams together in a room. Let's make them talk to each other. Let's make them understand everything that we know. And then let's see what they can come up with. So they appointed an independent commission uh, from a range of different countries, um, led by Karas Mal from South Africa, but people from the States, from Brazil, from Sweden, India, uh, and others, uh, and including uh, people who were, um, uh, who were uh, expert in understanding the impacts of dams and experts in the building of them. 
They wrote 130 technical papers. They did uh, seven um, in-depth case studies, and they in total reviewed 125 dam projects. They took depositions from 1,400 people, uh, and, uh, and they took other submissions from, from another 1,000 from outside that. So it was a heck of a process uh, over four or five years to uh, produce uh, the output. This is what they went through. They basically did a whole series of um, uh, thematic reviews, case studies, regional consultations, uh, generated the knowledge base, then they synthesized, then they produced a final report. So it was a wonderful effort to kind of render down global knowledge uh, on dam construction. And they produced a final report uh, in November 2000, which was launched by Nelson Mandela in London. It came up with seven strategic priorities and five key criteria. These are the seven strategic priorities. This was their view as to how you do dams properly. So if you start the, the, the top left, you need to gain, uh, well, let's start top right, comprehensive options assessment. You need to look at all the options, the river basin planning. Second, you need to address existing dams, understand what's already there in the river basin, understand how they relate to one another. You have to look at uh, rivers and livelihoods uh, in the round, and you have to think about sustaining those rivers and livelihoods. You need to recognize entitlements and, benefit and, and sharing of benefits. You need to recognize the needs and the rights of people in the river basin uh, to the resources they have. You need to ensure compliance. You need to make sure that what's done is what's supposed to be done. You need to share rivers, and you need to gain public acceptance. So a set of seven principles. They don't lead on from one another. They're all parallel to each other. And it's not an unreasonable list. If you want equitable and sustainable development of water and energy resources, this is what you need to do. That's what they said. And these are their five key criteria. And you can see them flowing down this sort of decision tree on the right. And it's interesting that they only get to the dams about halfway down. The first one is do a needs assessment. Validate the needs for water and energy services. And they said that has to be a decentralized and participatory consult consultation process. You don't just give this remit to a bunch of consultants from Switzerland or, or, or the UK or the US. It's got to be done with the people who are affected. That's the first thing. The second is select the alternative strategies. Look at the preferred development plan from among the full range of options. And if necessary, you have to do studies to enable you to do that. And again, they wanted participatory, multi-criteria assessment. So you weigh up social and environmental and technical and financial aspects. You don't simply build, propose the dam, which is the biggest, has the biggest uh, cost-benefit ratio, but you, you, you have to do it as a multi-criteria assessment that weighs up the, the different options. And that, at that level, of course, you consider is there a better way of doing it? Are there non-dam options as well as dam options? And you've got to be sh quite sure before you start putting millions of tons of concrete in the ground that you're going down the right road. Four, during project implementation, when you're designing and building the thing, um, that you have to focus on, uh, have to make sure that the project has benefit sharing and mitigation measures. In other words, that the project is not simply going to create losers who will be dumped somewhere. Benefit sharing, if you were watching the video earlier, for example, the idea of a trust fund uh, generated out of the revenue from hydropower, which, which trickles money over, over, the, over time into resettled communities, something like that. There's a benefit sharing option um, and that um, there are mitigation measures, that you actually minimize the environmental and social impacts and you actually deliver compensation as and when it's required, just what those videos are rather neatly arguing for. Um, and, and that you have to have a system which checks that this is hap really happening. It's not that you write in a report, that's what you're going to do, and then you don't bother to check it. Uh, so the, in terms of the project I started with, the Soccer 2 River, I mean, even as problems emerged, they weren't fixing them, and that's not the way to do it. Fifthly, and lastly, um, you have to think about project operation that is adapting to changing context. You don't just build a dam Stick, it, stick the concrete in the river and walk away. You've got to manage it. You've got to have a management a program. And if it turns out that there are impacts you haven't thought of, you've got to address those impacts. So you need to think about all of the operating rules and the licensing conditions and so on. And if you follow through that route, so the commission said, um, you will get a dam which is economically effective, socially uh, beneficial, and environmentally reasonably unharmful. 
Brilliant, absolutely lovely. Lots of very simple sort of motherhood and apple pie suggestions. How are you going to deliver that? Well, they said what you need to do is through criteria and guidelines. They had guidelines for everybody. They had guidelines for civil society, for government, international standards. They wanted multilateral and bilateral donor organizations to have standards, professional organizations to have standards, civil engineers should, should agree how dams ought to be done. Uh, the private sector would have codes of practice, due diligence policies, certification. International agreements would be specific. Everywhere you turned, if you were interested in dams, there'd be a, there'd be a, a, you know, a tick list you had to sign off on. Well, that's what they offered. It didn't really have the effect that they hoped. Um, it didn't have no effect, but it didn't have the effect that they hoped. And the reason is that, um, uh, well, the, 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 the analysis mostly is that developing country governments, and I have to say other actors in the dam industry, didn't like it. Um, Asit Biswas, who was someone who was very expert on dam construction, wasn't involved in the commission, and I, I think w was always resentful of the fact that his expertise wasn't directly called upon, um, argued that the uh, that developing countries um, uh, rejected the report as biased, a biased against dams. And the argument goes that the report was too negative, and too anti-growth. It made it impossible to build dams. You couldn't possibly do all the things that the report asked you to do. It was too impractical. The World Bank Water Resources Strategy said that the multi-stage negotiated process is too slow. They were in a hurry uh, to move forward. And this process of asking everybody nicely what they thought about it just was unrealistic. So the solutions were too complex and too bureaucratic. And perhaps the problems were too complex. Perhaps the impacts were more uh, than could be well taken into account. So a huge effort to get it right, and basically people look at the report and go, nah, that doesn't work for us. It's not what we're going to do. So the, the, the new boom in hydropower dam construction basically isn't following that route at all. Um, it's side bypassing it uh, completely. Um, it's a very rapid uh, growth, particularly um, in, uh, in Asia, but also lots of plans now coming through in Africa, which is the content I know most. And the result of the dam building boon of the present and the, and the past is there is almost no river basin which isn't already partially controlled. This is a rather nice uh, study um, led by a, a Swedish um, ecologist called Kristen Nilsson on the fragmentation of flow regulation of the world's largest river systems. And the red ones are the most transformed. Uh, and there's an awful lot of river systems where the flow regime is now substantially shifted already by dam construction and many dams proposed on the other river systems as well. So why is it so hard to, um, why is it so hard to get dams right? Why is it so hard to build dams? And I, I would say, as much as I should say, it, it may be obvious, I think almost all of the dams that are now being, or many of the dams that are now being planned will have many or most of the problems that were familiar from the 20th century. Um, so despite everything that was learned, despite the attempt to synthesize that, I think the, the, many of the dams that are being built are precisely uh, falling into the same traps as the old ones. Why is it so difficult to get it right? Well, firstly, impacts are really complicated. Um, to understand the, the, the many dimensions of impact of something as simple uh, uh, as what a, what a child would do in a stream, putting a log across the stream to make a dam. To understand the impacts of that on social and environmental systems and on economies is really complicated. It needs multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary planning. It needs lots and lots of different disciplines. And those sort of teams are really hard to fit together. Uh, it's the kind of mixture we've got in our new project. And it's, it's big and exciting, but it's really difficult to make it work in real time. Um, uh, and so multidisciplinary planning is really, really hard, and that's what you need to do. Secondly, many of the impacts are remote from the dam. They're hard to analyze, they're hard to mitigate, they're hard to compensate. Lots and lots of people scattered down a river valley are hard to reach. You don't know what they're called, you don't know what their villages are called, you've got to spend loads of time finding out who they are and what they do and how what they do might be affected. Sets of people growing crops and you don't know whether they want more water or less water, do they need water in August or water in January? So you've got to go and ask them and that takes ages. So it's really difficult to find out what's needed. Secondly, physical project boundaries are still narrow and predefined. We're good at building dams, we're not good at thinking holistically about river basins. 
Thirdly, many impacts are delayed. They don't come immediately. They're not obvious. Uh, they, affect or they are affected by, let's say, uh, rainfall variations. If you have you know, dry years, uh, two years out of 20, in the dry years, you may have a really serious downstream water shortage problem, which doesn't show up, might not show up for 18 years. Um, uh, so it's really tricky to think about the, the dynamism over time. And we're in a hurry. We're always in a hurry. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals push us into being in a hurry. We're impatient to tackle, uh, um, we're impatient to tackle uh, poverty, to make poverty history. Uh, and dam builders are in a terrible hurry. Dam planners are in a terrible hurry. Fourthly, river basins cross borders, all kinds of borders, different jurisdictions within countries, different countries. And institutional and political issues are really significant. And I put... Uh, um, Fela Kuti's uh, album cover up here uh, from Nigeria in the 1960s, Authority Stealing. We're aware of the kind of complexities that there are around very large, very lucrative construction projects. Dam construction is not simply a technical business, it's also a political economic business. And lastly, dam impacts interact. There are complex and emerging issues. One that's just coming up at the moment is concern about uh, um, the, the carbon uh, it takes to make the concrete to build the dam. And also, more intriguingly, I found this the other day, I was thinking about it, uh, about methane. It turns out that, that the methane production from reservoirs globally is a significant factor uh, in climate change uh, thinking. It's somewhere... Um, uh, it's about the same uh, as the emissions, methane emissions from biomass burning, including biofuels. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, and the, the people doing the analysis say um, that uh, we need to incorporate uh, greenhouse gas fluxes and reservoirs in future uh, assessments of uh, anthropogenic forcing uh, of climate change. And that we need to be really careful, careful not to build reservoirs where you're going to have a large methane release problem. So not to have reservoirs where you've got large inflows of, uh, of nitrogen, for example, uh, downstream of the city. Very bad idea. Um, so methane production uh, is, is, a, is something that really wasn't around in the, in the uh, 20th century to worry about. And it's a new dimension one has to think about. Okay, so... That's where the new project comes from. I'm, what I've done is tell you what the problem is. I've also told you, I think, that the problem's not a particularly new one, but even though its dimensions have been known for a long time, uh, we're not particularly good at dealing with it. So the, the, uh, the, the new project uh, that we're, we're involved in is essentially trying to square the circle in exactly the way that the World Commission on Dams tried to do, trying to, do, to provide a way of making decisions about dams, such you get all the good things and none of the bad things. And the option, David's already mentioned this, but it's clear that dams have the potential to contribute to the sustainable development goals. It's clear that uh, they can generate power, they can provide water, they can supply irrigation schemes, and those have the potential to unlock uh, uh, poverty in, in really uh, valuable ways. It's also clear that poorly designed projects, projects that are in the wrong place, exacerbate social and political uh, uh, instability, and they cause environmental degradation. Uh, they're in more trouble than they're worth. And choosing between the two is the tricky things. The program is going to ask three things. David's mentioned this. What are we, what's happening now? Uh, what is happening in, in international dam planning? What needs to happen differently? And how do you do it? And we're specifically bringing... Um, a, a set of uh, doing a set of case studies, David's mentioned, but also focusing on a new set of methods around new kinds of modeling. And I suppose the key thing to me, and this is I'm not a modeler, this is my interpretation of it, is that it's a desire to stop the fragmented thinking that's dominated 20th century dam building, to offer whole systems thinking, a kind of holistic analysis, understanding systems of dams, not single projects. Understanding dams not as single-purpose deliverers of flows of benefits, uh, but as something that, are, that deliver water, that as water and energy interventions, and that address operation as well as construction. And you can see here a diagram of a river basin, which is you know, where the, the environment is being thought of in an integrated kind of way. Uh, this is a very European sort of perspective where the water movement into and out of the floodplain is taken into account, where the different uses of the floodplain flood are taken into account. We need this kind of sophistication, not just rivers like the Rhine or, 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 or the Thames, 
but for, for rivers like the Nile uh, and the Volta uh, uh, and the Irrawaddy. And we need that. It's no good saying, I'm sorry, we haven't got the space for sophisticated thinking in developing country rivers because it's the sophisticated thinking uh, that is going to deliver the outcomes that we want. So I'm going to finish with two quotes from people that uh, were involved in the World, World Commission on Dams. This is from Kada Asmal, a uh, South African, uh, talking uh, uh, in the introduction. This is what he wrote in the introduction to the uh, World Commission on Dams report. He says, telling me, a harried public official who must answer to 48 million restless, hungry, and thirsty people to ensure development is sustainable and humane is like warning me, operate, but don't inflict new wounds. I know that. What I don't know is how to do it. That's what the World Commission tried to do. It didn't quite work. That's, in a sense, what we're trying to do uh, uh, as well. I'll finish with uh, Nelson Mandela. Do you remember the days when, when politicians could be looked up to in the un that sort of unproblematic way? He flew to London um, to launch the, the, the project. He thought it was that important. And he talked a lot about... Uh, he put uh, dam construction in the context of uh, South Africa and his own, uh, his own life. He said, many millions of us have stood on one side, outside state decisions. Yet it's one thing to find fault with an existing system. It's another thing altogether, a more difficult task, to replace it with an approach that is better. That's the challenge with dams, to stand inside the system uh, and not, uh, not outside, to replace the faulty system, not just to critique it, but to replace it with an approach that's better. Now, it would be slightly ambitious to say that we're going to do that. We can't quite see our way forwards, but that, I think, is what the project is trying to achieve. Um, I'm good at identifying the problem. Hopefully, the project will be good at finding a solution. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Bill, for that excellent lecture, taking us through the history and showing us that certainly the problems that we're looking at in Dams 2.0 have been looked at by very intelligent and very noble people in the past, and that uh, we, yeah, we, uh, we must try to build on what's been, uh, been done. Um, I did like that final quote, an approach that is better. We've spent a lot of today at one stage talking about whether we were going to design a model or a framework, and we decided that approach was the right sort of term uh, for us. And to find that Nelson Mandela chose that term, um, yeah, it makes me feel good um, because uh, one of us has to respect what Nelson Mandela said. Um, I'm just going to introduce now uh, Professor Julian Harrow, who's uh, 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 the research director of DAMS 2.0 from the uh, Mechanical Aerospace and Civil Engineering School at Manchester. Uh, Julian is particularly involved in looking at the uh, decision-making processes and particularly modeling of complex decision-making processes. And again, just thinking of what Bill was finishing off with, with uh, talking about whole systems thinking. Julian's been pushing us through this today. We've actually had a whole systems thinking day. And many of us feel as though our brains are exploding as we try to think of all the connections and all the forms of knowledge and all the disciplines that are needed. But uh, we are making serious efforts to see if we can connect, uh, connect the disciplines together to produce this whole systems theory. Julian's going to talk for a few minutes, four or five minutes, some comments on on the, yep, should we, should we put you in the middle, Bill? Okay, um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm pleased um, to follow a, a political ecologist. So um, in the past, uh, dams were the remit of engineers, but in the last 20 years, uh, we've realized that, that that is maybe not ideal. And so to have a political scientist and a, um, and a development specialist and a political ecologist uh, here on the stage shows that we, we've evolved um, in, in assessing dams and thinking about them. So that's a good sign. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Bill um, Bill Adams. This was a very, very interesting talk. Uh, so a few things struck me. Um, well, first of all, you, you underlined the unpredictable consequences of dams, both human impacts and ecological. And of course, that made me as an engineer and as a, as a modeler, um, and many of us have become modelers in the last two decades, unfortunately. It's just so much cheaper to buy a computer than to go out in the field and talk to people. And unfortunately, modeling is, is just the way that the universe seems to be advancing and how humans are making decisions. But when you, when you show these unpredictable consequences, well, I did, uh, that did make me pause. So thank you for that. Um, will we be able to model unpredictable consequences? Maybe not. 
So um, certainly humility is, is, uh, is appropriate here. Um, you also, it seems like you were underlining very complex trade-offs between benefits um, and those benefits accruing to different sectors, to different costs, to different social groups. Um, that seemed a very sophisticated and complex problem. And not only benefits are being shared and traded off, but also costs, uh, painful costs to the environment and to people. And it seemed like you were underlining that often it's local people that are suffering and people in rural areas for uh, larger cities and maybe uh, more uh, wealthy and developed areas to benefit. So thanks for underlining that. Um, you picked up a few, a few things that seemed to underline the challenges and opportunity of, of dams and systems of dams. Um, the first was country negotiations. Um, it seems now in these 3,700 dams being proposed, many of them are on, uh, are on borders or impact several countries. So that seems to be a dimension that is, is a bit intimidating. Um, in a lot of the examples you showed, these were national dams. If, if dams make problems within countries, how are they going to make problems between countries? That, that worried me. Um, maybe an opportunity now with energy. Well, it seems like um, the, the, the interaction between dams and energy seems so complicated. There's energy markets. The, the, the rich nations have engaged in energy markets. That didn't exist when most of these dams were being proposed. Um, and also enabling renewable energy. That seems to be a good opportunity. So it seems like a lot more complexity than there used to be there. Sedimentation, um, if all the dams, if we depend on dams to enable renewables, but all the dams fill up in 50 years of sediment, what are we going to do then? That was a, something that worried me. Um, you know, what if in the future ecosystem, what if our main wealth, the wealth of nations in the future becomes ecosystems? What if people go there and that's really the way that they resource themselves? Will there be any left? And finally, finance. We have a group of financiers involved and they, um, should dam builders get access to good financial conditions? That's really, um, really a question. You know, is, are dams a really positive thing? Should they get better deals than investing in, in other things? Um, so uh, those were some summaries. I, I was like the fact that you showed Hetch Hetchy. In fact, um, where I did my PhD in California, we did a study on that dam, and we had a whole economic water energy market of the entire state, and we just took that dam and plucked it out. And it turns out that there was no negative economic impacts of removing that dam. So that dam was built in the second Yosemite Valley. So Yosemite Valley is the biggest national park in the United States, most visited. And half of it is occupied by this dam. And we just removed that dam. And there was no economic impacts and energy impacts on California. So you, you makes you wonder, if the, is that dam there? And finally, this World Commission on Dams, um, in, you know, so, so the Hetch Hetchy made me think, you know, can systems analysis, can it help us in better designing dams? And finally, the World Commission on Dams, um, it sounds like they did amazing things right. I'm, I'm disappointed it didn't have better upkeep, uptake. So what do you think were the biggest World Commission on Dams successes that we could maybe emulate in this project? And how can we avoid these problems of bias, anti-growth, impractical, and too slow? How could we avoid that? So maybe just in my response, systems analysis, is that going to save the day here? That study of Hetch Hetchy just removing it, seeing how, it, um, you know, that's obviously not something that they did when they built that dam. Um, and what were the biggest World Commission on Dams successes? And how can we avoid the problems of the World Commission on Dams? So thanks very much, Bill Adams. Cheers. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to quickly answer those and then we we'll let the audience come in as that, that's the, those small questions yeah I'm not sure I can actually answer them I mean um, I think the the World Commission on dams uh, if you like tripped up over its own shoelaces it was so big uh, that it's that, that uh, um, it, it, it's quite hard for people to synthesize it I mean it's quite hard to read the stuff let alone read the supporting materials but I think it did a really good job of synthesizing the the, the nature of, of the impacts um, if you look on the on the internet you can see a lot of lectures being given to students about the nature of the impacts of dams I think that those many of those impacts some of them are new but many of them are quite well understood we know quite a lot now for example about the flow requirements of, of fish in rivers we know quite a lot about the way in which floodplain farmers use need 
need water supply. So, and that synthesis was very effective, I think. Secondly, I think they really drew attention to the importance of um, taking all the people affected with you into the project. The, the videos earlier were, were pulling that out in the West African context rather well, I thought, uh, in terms of securing land rights, in terms of uh, making sure that the promises that are made are realistic to, to people who are going to be resettled, for example, are realistic, fair, truthful, and that what is promised comes through. Those kind of basic principles of good governance, I think they drew attention to, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, although, I mean, you know, it's, it's always easy to be idealistic realistic delivering that in the in the in the uh, sort of fog of of war which is governance in, in is quite tricky but those are good things I think and I think they empowered um, uh, the the um, civil rights movement uh, the environmental justice movement internationally to uh, to demand those things as a proper way of doing business so I think there's some very good things like that how could I mean we're not a world commission we don't have you know all those people we don't have all that time I think what we do have uh, um, through the sort of the is the modeling work and I think in a sense that to me that goes back to the early principles um, which were in you know, 1904 on the Nile River, which is let's understand the dynamics of this system. Now we want to understand it in a, as a multi, you know, a system that's not just water. Uh, it's not just water and power or water power and irrigation, uh, or, but it also takes into other accounts. And of course, you can go mad doing that, um, but it's, it's an interesting thought experiment. And I think it should be a helpful one to the people who are having to make these decisions. Okay, we've got a... I think 10 minutes now for some questions. Uh, if you'd like to put questions to Bill, and Julie may also answer them. If you put your hand up, can you make sure your questions are really focused um, so that you don't take up too much time? Um, and uh, if you put your hand up, we'll give you a microphone. I think there's somebody up there, Chris. Uh, we take two or three questions, so if there's anybody on Mina's side who'd like to ask a question, they can follow our colleague. Uh, nice and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the, both the speakers you know, for uh, interesting presentation. And uh, you know, my question is, uh, it's quite ambitious and I like you know, the project, but sometimes is it possible you know, to address the problem of dams under the current political economic uh, context? You know, let me give you know, the Nile River you know, as an example. You know, we have you have showed us, you know, the videos, the how to make a sustainable dam. But that requires, at least in the short run, you know, getting finance. But to, for upstream uh, Nile, Street, uh, Nile uh, River uh, riparian countries, they cannot access finance from international uh, financial organizations because Egypt doesn't give its consent, you know, uh, to, uh, to allow uh, dams to be constructed in Uganda or Ethiopia or Kenya. And at the same time, let's zoom in into Ethiopia and we have a government that uses such kinds of you know, huge monumental projects like the dam, like the Grand Renaissance Dam, you know, to gain <coughs> legitimacy to its authoritarian rule. So is it possible to address under this kind of political context, is, is it possible to address or to improve dams or make them sustainable? Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to follow with the second question? Okay, let's, let's move on to that one then, Bill. That was a Thank you. It's, a good, a it's, it's a good question. And I mean, I think what I would say is quite early in the 20th century, we had got pretty good at building dams. We get the, you know, we get the concrete right. Um, and um, that expertise is out of all proportion to the difficulty of handling issues of, um, of governance, resource governance, uh, and, 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 and equity. So, uh, no, I mean, I guess I say two things. One is, if you wait until you have the, if you wait until you have all the governance um, measures in place, uh, that you can have sort of a fully participatory planning process, then you're going to wait a very long time um, and you're not going to fix the poverty problems. Equally, yes, if, you have a, if you're trying to put a project in place in a country where there are serious failures of governance, whatever that might involve, failures of competence or, uh, or anything else, then um, you're unlikely to uh, find the... Uh, find them paying attention to the, the negative dimensions and addressing them
properly. Uh, it's an ideal world that was pre presented in those videos where you have a benign, intelligent uh, um, uh, government which is able to, to, to deal uh, right with those people. I don't, so, I, I mean, no, I don't think you can get it right. I think one thing you can do is be, be fairly transparent, and I think um, one of the things that's important is that um, people are open-minded about the, or recognize that dams bring great benefits and can bring great harm. Uh, and if you open explicit about that, then you can have a discussion about what, what, you, what you're going to do about that. Um, um, and that's about all you can do. And I think the model that, that Julian's sort of de been developing and the team's going to develop, I think is never going to be more than uh, an assistance to decision making. And, and people can make good decisions with that new in, that those new insights, or they can make bad decisions. They can ignore it. It's always the way. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else um, like to follow up with that? Another question there? Giving very shy tonight. Our colleague in the front. The second question there. Okay. Hi. Um, I think one of the things that highlight is highlighted in your presentation is about. Uh, understanding the way in which people are using rivers. And we've been talking today about uh, trying to incorporate indigenous knowledge. So I was wondering, in your experience, um, do you think indigenous knowledge can be incorporated effectively into modeling and the sort of knowledge that this product is going to produce? Thanks. And I've got a second question, I think, here. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Uh, considering the cost of the dam when a country decides that uh, it will benefit the economy of, of, its country, uh, of this country, they doesn't consider the uh, external effect of the other country. Like, uh, an example, I can say the Farakkabad, which is between India and Bangladesh. And as a consequence, uh, Farakkabad, uh, I have seen that the river Podda is getting dried and the uh, negative effects of the Farakabad, I've seen, experienced it uh, from the very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, closely. So what should be the solution here? Like, uh, while con constructing a, uh, a uh, dam, when uh, the, uh, they, uh, how can they uh, include this external uh, cost into, um, uh, into constructing this dam? Like, uh, my question is, how can in, uh, a country, when constructing a dam, can include the external cost of the uh, other countries? Okay, thanks very much. Bill, do you wanna? Okay, thanks. Um, uh, the first question was about um, uh, indigenous knowledge, and you might call it indigenous and local knowledge. Um, can it be incorporated, in, incorporated into models? It's a very good uh, question. I mean, in a sense, modeling is about abstractions. It's about, I mean, it has to involve the, gen, the creation of, um, it seems to me anyway, a creation of sort of rather generalizable relationships. So you, a lot of detail gets lost. Um, and I think um, it's quite important to keep running across scale so you can re-explore you know, re um, uh, how people um, the variety of ways and the variety of knowledges that people bring to bear on water resources. I actually think knowledge is in some ways less significant to this than, than, um, than, than the values, if you like. I mean, it's not just, you know, I have the knowledge as to which variety of, of sorghum to plant because I think I know uh, what the flooding pattern is going to be. But it's also about the, the, the complex interplay of, of ideas about what the river's about, what, what it's for, what my land is for, what my family and farm is for. And so, I mean, I think those kind of things are quite challenging to the sort of a, a top-down uh, development agenda, even one that's meeting sustainable development goals. So if you actually listen to people, they ramble all over the place, have lots of ideas, many of which are challenging to the good plans that are being imposed on them. That's a tension which is in development uh, planning at all levels. And um, if you absolutely don't pay respect to where people are trying to get to, then they, they don't, you, you know, what you're trying to persuade them to do doesn't work. And that's true of any form of governance. So there has to be that sort of buy-in. Um, so I think understanding local ideas about rivers is really, really important. Um, and maybe those of us who plan, who think about development with a big D on a large scale need to 
to run down the scale a bit sometimes and, and understand how it's viewed locally. Um, and as a thought experiment, that's very useful. Um, so yes, I mean, um, yeah, field work that involves driving past in a Land Rover, let alone work that isn't, doesn't go into the field at all, is inherently uh, risky, and that's what increasingly we're made to do. Um, uh, the other question, I mean, I, I think what you were asking about was, was, was in a sense about, you know, um, it, says, it speaks to me about path dependence. There are very few major river basins where nothing has been done and where you have the time to think how to do it right. You're building around things that are already there. Um, and secondly, you're, you're trying to do sort of rational planning, or Julian's model will speak about rational planning, in, in a, a highly politicized world. Uh, and where you, know, you have cross-jurisdictional conflict, uh, latent or, or, or actual, it's extremely hard to deliver a, a, a technically rational, optimal solution. And that's, I mean, one of the things that I guess, you know, we, we say some of this, but one of the things that any modeling-based study um, barks its shin um, on, on the reality of everyday uh, conflictual planning. Julian, would you like to add anything to... Um, sure. The, um, well, the, the, yeah, the, I mean, the, the biggest problem is that the, the benefits um, are, are very tangible and the cost downstream, those externalities, like you said, can be untangible and unpredictable. So it's very easy to imagine the supply of water, the supply of electricity. But the downstream impacts, if they're less tangible, um, it's harder to qualify. And also, in many cases, uh, the decision-making framework is relatively primitive. There's a cost-benefit analysis of the dam, and it, that analysis is simply not wide enough to look at the downstream impacts. And so World Commission on Dams, in the outputs from this project, if they could encourage that a system-scale view, I think that, that then that, those externalities and those negative impacts downstream would, would just be put more to the forefront and not just focus on the benefits of the immediate asset. So I think that's a very good point, and it's a, it'll be in our mind in this project. There's uh, time just for one final question. Uh, I think this is a, Jamie Woodard from Geography. Um, I think this is an uh, observation rather than a question, but I work in the Nile Valley in Sudan with the British Museum, and there hasn't been any mention tonight of archaeology. One of the, if you're building big dams and big reservoirs in the Nile and in Mesopotamia, places like that, there's a huge loss of heritage and archaeology. And, um, and, and, and the planning for that is certainly something that we, can, that we can do better. So that's just an observation, really, I think. I wondered if, that, if that's factored into your thinking. So you're absolutely right. And, um, of course, I mean, there isn't, in many countries in the developing world, there isn't a full... Um, understanding of the nature of those 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 heritages, um, even uh, so, so it's not easy to to do. It's not easy to know what might be being lost. Um, it comes back to partly to the indigenous knowledge system and the, and the varying value systems. I mean, do you want to say something about? Have you thought about archaeological um, archaeological heritage in that way as a as a factor? I mean, I, I, I can't say anything about archaeology, but I can tell you something similar. In a, or something related, I think. Three months ago, we were asked by the International Finance Corporation to, in three months, evaluate alternative designs for a large new dam that they're proposing in Congo. And one thing that we did with the Nature Conservancy, which is an ecological organization, is that we looked at all the millions of combinations of all the dams that were possible. We looked at how many of them impacted how many square kilometers of gorilla habitat. And so my response would be, if you can map it, it can be considered. So if there are maps of archaeological heritage, it's very easy for projects like ours that auto automate the um, assessment of dams and their impacts. If it's mapped and the, if it's out there, if it's been published in open source, if those maps are available, then it can be very easy to, to consider. If the information is unknown, just like Bill said, it's gone. Okay, I think we're probably coming up to the, the limits of, of, uh, of time now. You've had a sort of a deep history of, uh, of dams and dam building and the problems and the benefits um, that, uh, that have been generated uh, by this. And you've got a little bit of a flavor about what we're uh, promising to do at Manchester and across uh, our partnership with universities and research institutes in the UK uh, and in Asia and, uh, and Africa. Um, 
I don't know, the, the final sort of thought I'm left with is, is just this incredible stretch that we've got. Um, our, our funder, the Global Challenges Research Fund, actually insists that we look at intractable social and economic problems and generate um, solutions. So they're encouraging us to be very ambitious, and we've been ambitious. But then having listened to Bill and listened to, uh, to all the knowledge that's been built up over the years and the work of the World Commission on dams, that also suggests that we need to have due humility, recognizing that many excellent minds have tried to work out how to get better dams, but have found that they're still trapped between this stop all dams no, just let us build the dam as quick as we can, this sort of Punch and Judy show, which seems to operate so often. Um, over the coming years, we'll be running a whole series of seminars, so you'll get a chance to hear and make your own judgment as to whether we're able to add to this knowledge um, or whether we are simply repeating the, the history that's preceded us. Um, I'd like you to, um, to thank uh, our lecturer, Bill Adams, for the great lecture he's given us. Thanks again, Bill. And, and to celebrate the birth of the DAMS 2.0 uh, Research Center, then we'd also like to offer you a, a glass of wine or fruit juice um, just outside now. So if, uh, if you'd like to meet with us to celebrate uh, the, the launch of the center, please do stay on. Thank you very much.